Hi, my name is Mandy Owens from the University of Washington. I'm going to be wrapping up our training series on medications for opioid use disorder in Washington State Jails. For our third part, we're going to talk about some common concerns related to medications for opioid use disorder in jails, where we will hear from Lieutenant Sapp from Kitsap County Jail, Victor Mendez, a recovery coach in OMAC, and I will address some of the other concerns that we have been hearing from folks. Some of the concerns that we are going to talk about include things like, aren't you swapping one drug for another? What about diversion in jails? And I just see the same people coming back through jail. So this first concern, aren't you swapping one drug for another, has come up during various trainings around the state with correction staff. People have asked things like, are we just feeding their addiction or making it worse by giving them these medications? Or is taking medications such as methadone and buprenorphine just replacing or substituting other substances such as heroin? And unfortunately, this concern has been reinforced by previous terminology of these medications such as opioid substitution therapy when describing methadone and buprenorphine. To begin to unpack this a little bit, I will bring us back to this slide from part one where we made the distinction between opioid dependence and opioid use disorder. So as you can see here on the left, for some people, when they start using opioids, it might develop into opioid dependence, which is a biological manifestation of opioid use disorder. And that for other people, this also continues into social and psychological problems. When people start to take medications such as methadone or buprenorphine, you can really start to see how this opioid dependence separates from the disordered part of opioid use disorder. So when people are taking any opioid, this includes methadone or buprenorphine, or any other prescribed opioids such as for pain, people may develop opioid dependence, this biologic, biological or physical dependence, which we see through tolerance and withdrawal. But when people are on medications for opioid use disorder, you can see improvements in these social and psychological problems such that relationship and work problems go down and they no longer are preoccupied with cravings for opioids or they're not using any drugs and other drugs anymore or not using as much. Said another way, you can see how medications for opioid use disorder address the disorder. So again, we saw this graph in part one that as people continue to use opioids or other drugs, this may develop into disordered use where people are up and down, up and down on this roller coaster of chaos. When medications enter the picture, they can finally start to stabilize their lives. No longer are they living in this disorder, living in chaos, but they can finally start to consistently feel quote unquote normal. And isn't this really what we want for the people that we see coming through jail? That they can finally feel normal so that they can th function better, get a job and feel like they are contributing again? So if you start to see this question come up for you, I would encourage you to think about how medications for opioid use disorder can reduce that disorder in people's lives and actually can help bring them to the shared goal that we have for them, for improving their lives, improving their families' lives, and improving our communities. What about diversion? This is perhaps the most common question we hear from jails and prisons when we talk about medications for opioid use disorder. To help answer this, let's check in with Lieutenant Penelope Sapp. Hi, I'm Lieutenant Penelope Sapp from the Kitsap County Sheriff's Office Jail. Great, welcome back. 
So one of the common concerns that we've heard most often when working with jails around providing medication for opioid use disorder programs are, what about diversion? I'm curious about your experiences and thoughts on that. Well, um, we all have those concerns, even with um, basic um, medication. But um, with the MAP program, let me tell you a little bit about how um, we kind of developed our plan uh, to avoid this and, and, and hopefully eliminate it. Um, when we started the MAP program, what we try to do is try to house the individuals, the patients that are on the program in the same um, units, of course, males with males, females with females. So in our dorm dormitory unit, we have a um, unit that's dedicated to the MAP program, as well as um, other programs that are, are reentry type. And um, that's just to have a unit that is um, you know, all about support, and uh, we don't have anybody in there that might try to bully or manipulate someone into um, cheeking their medication. So that's why we try to keep them all in one unit. Now, of course, that doesn't always work, and we have some that are maybe higher level classification, but um, we just try to generally keep our patients in there. And same with the females. We put them with the um, inmate workers where um, they're all trying to get right back on track. So you kind of have this culture in the, in the unit of, um, of healing, um, reentry, you know, getting back on track, that kind of thing, so. Great, so uh, housing has been a strategy for you. What other strategies have helped to reduce the risk of diversion? Well, it's, let's talk about med pass, right? So, I mean, anybody in corrections knows that's a very long process and that's no different with, with the MAP program. Um, what we do is we have an officer that um, goes with um, the MAT nurse throughout the facility. And sometimes if the uh, medical liaison officer is not available, we'll just have the pod officer um, come out and, and help them. So we have the patients come out onto the bench. They sit on their hands and um, the nurse will administer the medication. We crush the meds because it's a little quicker and um, more difficult for them to um, cheek the medication. They sit there with sitting on their hands. They sit on there, very little conversation um, and they're kind of spread out. And the officer and the nurse will um, sit and watch them and make sure that you know they're not touching their face or they're putting their hands by their face and what have you. And then afterwards, it's a very good mouth sweep and checking to make sure that um, everything is dissolved. And then that's also a good time for the officer to kind of engage in that conversation where I told you earlier um, that um, they can start hearing about the excitement of the patient being on the program, what they're going to do upon release and that, that type. So it goes kind of back to the, the culture, the culture change and shift and embracing the MAP program and seeing that it's working and that they're excited and not wanting to divert their medication. They don't, they, they want to take their medication. And then, you know, if we do have a diversion, well, I mean, it happens, it happens with everything. We kind of, we kind of ask the patient, why? Why were you diverting your medication? First, we want to make sure there's not somebody in there trying to force them to divert their medication. And second, we, you know, if it's something like, well, it upsets my stomach, well, that's good to know. So maybe we shouldn't be giving you your medication on an empty stomach. Now we're not going to change their um, their medication time dispersing and not change everyone else's. So what we decided to do was do it after breakfast so that everyone's stomach was kind of full. So it's kind of like the patient was educating the corrections and the nursing staff. So that that was good. I mean, it was hit and miss learning learning about it, but um, diversion. Uh, didn't happen that often once we made those changes. So since um, kind of weighing all the, these things together, how do you weigh the risks of diversion to the benefits of the medication for opioid use disorder program? Well, that goes back to, you know, talking about those success stories when you're running into a patient off, off you know, on the street and they tell you how well they're doing. Um, you can't punish all for one person's mistake or even two people's mistake. That's not fair. Um, you know, we make changes to adapt to the challenges we overcome. But, you know, as corrections officers, and this has happened to all of us, we all hate when one person messes up and there's a new policy or a blanket email that goes out and we're all kind of being punished. So imagine that with a MAT patient 
now one person diverted their medication or two people diverted their medication and now we're getting rid of the program altogether that's not fair to the patients that's not fair to the community and and at, at the end of the day all corrections officers um, want to do is make a positive change in someone's life and that's what this program does so um, don't let a few few bad eggs met, wreck the entire bunch just um, move forward and learn from from those um, incidents well thank you so much lieutenant sap just wondering is there anything else that you would want to say to officers who might be working facilities where that these kinds of programs are new or are going to be coming yeah i mean you know it's change is always is always difficult um, this program while it will feel challenging at the beginning, it is completely worth it at the end. Um, like I said earlier, it's like our MAP program's not gonna fit other MAP programs is because you know the jails all have different footprints and we look different in, inside the facility. But um, just take a look at um, what you can do to make your MAP program a success and move forward with, move forward with it because um, it's so beneficial to um, not only your correction staff, but um, the patients, your community, and um, and that's what we what we do. Great, thank you. Thank you. I just see the same people coming back through jail. We have heard this from jail staff who have commented that they see people on medications for opioid use disorder repeatedly get rebooked. And so they wonder how helpful can this medication be if people keep coming back to jail? We have heard similar concerns coming from emergency rooms who also only see people when they are struggling by the nature of their settings. To start to address this, let's step back a little bit. It's very common for us all to base our opinions on what we see. So if we look at this slide at the bottom, it says what informs our opinions of medications for opioid use disorder for people in jail. If we're basing this on the people we see, those who were started on medications for opioid use disorder and came back to jail, we could have the thought of medications for opioid use disorder don't work at all for people coming out of jail. However, we may be missing people we do not see, those who were started on medications for opioid use disorder but did not come back to jail. To try to balance these factors a little bit more about what informs our opinions of medications for opioid use disorder for people in jail, let's start with this dark blue circle on the left. So some people on medications for opioid use disorder may still come back to jail, but that does not mean that they did not have any success when they were released. It is also likely that I am not seeing all of the people started on these medications who did not come back to jail. Also, there could be many reasons that people come back to jail. It's not always that they get picked up for a new charge. They could have been unable to pay a fine and that resulted in their reincarceration. We also know that it may take people multiple tries at recovery. So although a person might start medications and still come back to jail, when you see them again, this could be that time that sticks where they are able to be successful when they get released. And with that, let's hear from Victor. He has more than 25 years of incarceration, but now is working as a recovery coach in OMAC and is taking buprenorphine. Hello, hello. my name is Victor Mendez. I'm a SUD outreach uh, recovery coach for Family Health Centers in OMAC, Washington. Well, coming from a dysfunctional family, I hit the streets at age 11 to escape the beatings my dad would dish out to us when he got drunk. So I got involved with gangs, drinking and drugs at a very young age. I started out just drinking and smoking weed, then moved up to popping pills, whites, uppers, reds, downers, dropping LSD, you name it, I did it. By the time I was 13, I was already shooting heroin, which led to a life of crime to support my habit. 
which led to incarceration. From the age of 13 to age 18, I was in and out of juvenile detention facilities. As an adult, 25 years of my life in and out of various prisons up and down California. So I know all about incarceration, both physically and mentally. I have those photos of, of me and my homeboys. And I think we was getting ready to go out on a night of partying and gang banging and we'd all get together and everybody in those pictures, most of them are dead are doing life in prison whether they died of od getting shot stabbed whatever one of them uh, the cops beat him to death uh yeah the, the other one he od'd one of them was doing life and you know it, it's just like it's kind of sad you know and it's like sometimes i call up my one friend who also made it and we talk and Every time I call, he tells me, oh, man, what's his name? Oh, he, he's, he, he got 20 years or he's doing life or, hey, man, this guy's dead, got shot, oh, deed. And, you know, that's all my friends that I grew up with, for the most part, they're all gone. I would say somewhere in my mid-30s is when I started getting sick and tired of being sick and tired of the revolving door of my life and addiction had become. Get, get strung out, commit crime to support habit, get busted, go to jail or prison, get out, get strung out. I tried AA, NA, spirituality, psychology. I committed myself to 30-day inpatient rehab programs, 60 days, 90 days, 180 days programs for the most part after the second or third day of kicking heroin I would leave the program and get caught back up in the revolving door it wasn't until 2006 when I first moved up here to Washington state and was introduced to suboxone through family health centers MOUD program that I started to see the light at the end of the tunnel and it wasn't a train I still had my ups and downs got sent back to prison Finally, in 2008, when I discharged my parole and no longer had the luxury of using prison as my inpatient program to clean up, I was strung out homeless with nothing or no one. It was in 2012 when I moved back up to Washington State and got back on some boxing that I was truly able to get my life straight and worked out for the better. Finally, for once in my life, there were lots of demons I had to exercise myself of. I still have a couple of few that haunt me now and then, but thanks to MOUD, Suboxone, lots of therapy and prayer, I'm alive today. And as we used to say back in front of the prison board, a productive member of society. I most definitely would have participated in MOUD while incarcerated given in the chance back when I was going through the system. Who knows, maybe if I was introduced to MOUD 5, 10, 20 years earlier in my life of addiction and incarceration, things could have definitely changed for the better at a much younger age for me. Instead of getting my life together at age 50, I could have gotten my life together at the age of 30 or even 40. At present, thanks to MOUD, I was able to go back to school and get my degree in chemical dependency studies at a community college where I hope to go on and get my license to become a substance use disorder professional one day. Meanwhile, I became certified as a recovery coach to work with people with OUD, and it has given me the opportunity to expand my knowledge in SUD and grow professionally in the field of MOUD. I've been on Suboxone now for eight years straight. People tell me, oh, you just traded one substance for another. I tell them maybe, but at least Suboxone doesn't have me out robbing people to support my habit. Or I get, why have you been on Suboxone so long? Why don't you just get off it? And I tell them, hey, if it ain't broke, why fix it? All I know is that if it weren't for MOUD and Suboxone, I wouldn't be here speaking to you today. I would either be doing life in prison, seeing how I beat the three strikes law twice and the judge told me I wouldn't beat it the third time. He would make sure of that. Or I would just be dead. 
Luckily, the mill here closed in 2006, so they gave us the opportunity to take a year of unemployment or it would pay for two years of college. So that's when I was able to go back to college and it just worked out that they had a two year course for chemical dependency and it, and it was just that dream we always used to talk about in the prison yards. Like, man, we would make good prison, I mean, good uh, drug counselors, you know, because We've been there, done that, and you know, we know how to relate to people. They can get over us on BSs or anything. And uh, it just worked out that, yeah, chemical dependency. So I went to school. Uh, I got A, B average grades. Uh, I did make the Dean's List one time. That was pretty awesome. And so, you know, just little things like that and it starts building, you know, self-confidence because a lot of dopings, of course, got low self-esteem and, you know, we think we're worthless because we always have that past, our past, and we're dwelling on that, you know. I know as jail or prison guards, you have to deal with a lot of different people in jail or prisons with all sorts of personality disorders and every other disorder in between from sociopaths to psychopaths. But for the most part, a lot of those bodies walking in and out of those gates have some sort of substance use disorder. And sure, that's no excuse for breaking the law over and over again. All I'm saying is whether it's your hardened criminal or your innocent first time offender. They all have one thing in common. They're human beings with hopes and dreams of one day finding and making a new life. After all, no one wants to keep walking through those gates their whole lives, institutionalized or not. And with that, I would just like to thank my partner in love and life, my soulmate, Paula Hernandez, who stuck by me through thick and thin and never stopped believing in me, even when I didn't believe in myself. She saw something in me I never could have imagined. Me today, clean and sober on a career path, reaching out to others with substance use disorders, hoping they'll reach back. After all, you can't force anyone to straighten up. They have to truly want it and want it and want it again. Rare is the person with all of life's disorders to wake up one day and say, I'm cured. I just thank my lucky stars for being blessed with a patient, stubborn, truly loving and caring woman. So hopefully you can find it within yourselves to encourage someone to make their dream a reality and instill hope in those you guard. After all, who knows, the life you change or save today could be one of your own tomorrow. And that wraps up our three-part training series on medications for opioid use disorder in Washington State Jails. We really appreciate your time and attention. If you have any questions, feel free to ask other staff at your jail or contact me directly at mandyo at uw.edu. Thank you so much.